to be I was running a skateboard camp for kids one summer. Then I'd come to find out their dad owns an adult film company. He goes, hey, like, I want to talk to you about a project. He goes, I want to make a skateboarding adult film and I want you to produce it. This podcast is brought to you by Squarespace, and you guys know how much I love Squarespace. In fact, I use it for my own website, adamlearner.net. If you guys want to save 10% on your Squarespace in domain, use the code ADAM at checkout, A-D-A-M, and you'll save 10%. All right, guys, here we are today with another episode of the Brooklyn Photoworks ISO 320 podcast. And, uh, you know, I keep saying it's a special day, but of course, it's always a special day when we're back online, especially when we have amazing photographers that can take the time to join us. And today we have an amazing photographer coming from his studio in downtown Los Angeles, Stefan Vanesco. Um, he's somebody that um, I only kind of recently got introduced to. And wow, as soon as I got introduced to it, I'm like, holy crap, you got to look at this guy's Instagram. He's got over half a million followers. So obviously something is, is, is happening over here. And, and I'm like, no, no kidding, really. Just look at this dude's Instagram. There's incredible work. Each each individual photo here is its own work. Um, so you could absolutely get lost looking at some of the photography here and that I know that I have and I could spend all day just looking at his work and talking about his work. But today we have Stefan on our podcast, which is such an absolute immense treat. Now, I briefly asked Stefan what type of photographer he is, because oftentimes I just want to get it right. You know, I want to make sure I can pronounce some of these names properly and that I kind of get, a, you know, I can kind of give my take on what type of photography I'm seeing. And I'm seeing like what I would consider to be like some streets, some fine art. Um, there's even portraiture up here. And the thing that I love about this is that I feel very connected to that mentality and that I love photography to the point where even though like I guess I specialize in certain things or I have kind of tried to kind of make myself specialize I still like to shoot everything so without further ado let's give it over to Stefan and uh, thank you so much for joining us welcome to the podcast it's so great to have you with us today uh, thank you guys. I appreciate, you know, the invite and the opportunity to come hang out and talk photography with you guys. And I'm sure we'll probably talk like us at some point as well. Well, you want to just hearing... jump right into it? I mean, <laughs> yeah, don't, even, don't even, don't even hesitate. Dan, Dan's ready. No, uh, you know. Yeah, I think that we could actually jump right into the M10R because I think that you have been doing a lot of, um, a lot of posting with it, which is something that's, that Daniel and I are so incredibly excited about because I don't want to get too deep onto it. I'll let you take it over in just a sec. But there's there, there was like a whole kind of press junket where they gave all these loggers, the M10R, who took pictures of like, you know, trash bins and whatever. And it's like, ugh, can't stand that, you know, <laughs> no disrespect, because I think yeah. there's some amazing people out there that are that are doing coverage of, of this type of stuff. But to have an actual talented fine art photographer, somebody who's got a statement, who's got a mission, who's got really kind of some meat behind their work with that tool in their hands. That's the kind of photography that I want to see, especially when there's a new tool out there. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I was fortunate enough that they asked if I'd be interested in trying out this new camera system. Um, and of course, I mean, I love shooting with M's. So the opportunity to shoot with an M10R was, was pretty exciting. Um, it was also a curiosity, like kind of going down a rabbit hole where it's like, okay, the M10P has been really good with 24 megapixels. Here's this new one that's like 40 megapixels, uh, more better dynamic range, all these like uh, bells and whistles kind of thing. So, uh, you know, I wanted to take it out. Um, and I guess pairing with the glass was really interesting because obviously Leica makes amazing lenses. So it's like now you have this redefined sensor um, with this glass. And I don't know, just the scale of the photographs, I, de I think definitely changed when you're making them. Like it's more impactful to yourself. I guess, I guess that's one way I would say it. Now, when you say more impactful to yourself, um, that sounds pretty deep, and I want you to unpack that a little bit for me <laughs> because yeah. it, that's something that obviously resonates for you, but, but how do, how, what do you exactly mean by that? For somebody who's just listening and trying to yeah. understand that um, and hasn't had a chance to really dig deep into your your, your And what kind of images were you shooting with before that you're co comparing the art what to? What kind of camera? 
No, what kind of M's? Did you have an M10? Oh, I, I mean, I mean, I've been shooting with Leica for like eight years, and like yeah. my collection is like I started with an M6, used M6 I bought. I had the M240, 246, M9 Monochrome, M10P. Uh, I have the S007. I have SL12, like the whole array. So I've experienced like all these different okay. formats of cameras that they make. Um, so I mean, you know. For me, I think the biggest comparison was like, okay, I shot with the S007, medium format, digital sensor, some almost similar specs as far as megapixels. Um, so I kind of understood like the scale of like shooting with like that large of a sensor size, especially on a medium format, but now adapt that to an, an M10R. So what I meant by impact was, and I think the best analogy I came up with was like, imagine someone who's a sketch artist or a painter or whatever, your canvas is an eight, eight and a half by 11 paper size. You're going to work within that scale to make something, right? But then if you say, okay, now you have a four foot by six foot canvas, like how do you want to paint that? They're going to approach it way differently. Scale, depth, all that kind of stuff. Interesting. So impactful to me meant like, yeah, it's a similar uh, frame size to or sensor size to the M10P, but the more megapixels gives you a bigger canvas. So you, for me, it was more or less approaching how I saw things, where's the depth in it? Where's like, how deep does the shadow go? What's the contrast, what's the vibrancy? I started taking all that stuff in when shooting with that camera because I felt it was a different approach than just how I would with say an M10P. You know, it's an interesting concept because I, I also feel the same way. Like when you, when you open up, you know, like a 40 megapixel file next to a 24 megapixel file and you put them one to one, let's say, you know, the 40 megapixel files like here, <laughs> And the mm -hmm. 24 is here. You know, there's, there's, it's so much bigger. There's so much more, there's so many more pixels in there. But interestingly, the size of the actual frame is still 35 millimeter, the actual mm -hmm. dimension. So it's, it, it, it's, I guess, like understanding that and then understanding how that's going to apply to your workflow is probably mm -hmm. kind of like how you, I don't know. I don't even know where I'm going with this. <laughs> um, but what I, 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 I don't know. I was talking mean, about workflow. Any, anytime you can talk about workflow and, you know, I mean, I mean, like, yeah, I, I, workflow is key. No, no um, I, I do like the the what I find about bigger megapixel sensors is that the files, in my view, tend to be a lot richer. The blacks mm -hmm. tend to be blacker. The mm -hmm. you tend to have a whole lot more recovery. So the amount of latitude that you have, even though the actual frame is still the same three by two, you have a lot more latitude within there. And like you said, because there's so many more megapixels, the canvas has suddenly greatened in size. Yeah, I, I just think for me personally, it's like if you pay attention to those those specs or those details within a photograph, when you go out now, you start considering more. Like, you know, it's not just like the like the subject matter that's merely in front of you, but you want to really consider like what's behind it, what's going on elsewhere in the photograph, and how do I use that in a sense of scale or uh, framing, you know, with, with the image now. So I think that's that's more or less what I was meaning by the impact, where it's like okay, impact and how I see. It, with this mm -hmm. camera and how I make photos with this camera. So when I go out, I'm, I'm considering a lot more than just like this thing that's like six feet in front of me. I want to consider like the whole environment more so now. How's the character of, um, cause one of the only thing, it was very hard, like Adam said before, to try to find any information. I mean, I sold my M10 just getting ready for the M10R. There was no doubt in my mind. Mm -hmm. And then I was left being like, what do I look at? I got, I got nothing to go on. <laughs> the only thing I had, the only thing I have to go on is, um, people talking about the eh, the color. Maybe it's a firmware thing, the, the, the skin tone, and just these terrible. Uh, no real photographers had the M10R that was that were talking mm -hmm. about, you know, what it can do, and because I, I shoot with the M10M, um, so I I'm I know what a forty megapixel, mm -hmm. um, what it's basically without the color filter, um, but then I was left without an M10. So I bought an, I, I bought a friend's M10P because I didn't really want to be without it. I was like, you know what? I don't have enough to go on to like, to upgrade. Um, if you mm -hmm. want to call it, if you want to call it an upgrade. Um, but does it have the same character? Does it have the same look to the files or? I, th I think different. Cause I mean, primarily like how I've been, where my, my mindset's kind of been at in the past, like couple of years more so is like, digitally all day like i love shooting with the monochrome like black and white digital works for me uh, i do a lot of film shooting still 
um, I went through this kind of like explorative rut where I was not maybe turned off to like color digital. So shooting just like, you know, all different types like slide film and uh, negative I've been film, in that rut for, negative. for a long time. So we can, yeah. We'll, so we'll, talk, we'll circle back to that rut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so ra- rabbit hole. <laughs> so that was, I mean, and that was like the exciting thing was like a, a test to myself was, okay, I have the M10R. Let me primarily focus on shooting in this with color. You know, it's, it's a way to rediscover color. And that's kind of what it felt like to me. Um, I really enjoyed the colors that came out of it. Um, I honestly, I had an M10P and I just w- wasn't shooting with it enough. And I s- actually sold it a few months back. I think like right a month or so after quarantine was really hitting. Um, Good. So you uh, sold it before it- they dropped the price. Yeah. 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 Um, we bought, I bought mine a week before they dropped the price. Oh, nice. It was used, but you know. <laughs> yeah. So do you feel that, that the M10R replaces the M10P for you? For me, it does. Um, just because it's one of those things where it's like, do you really need 40 megapixels? Like that, there's that age old discussion, 24 to 40. And I think just the only thing I could tell someone was like, go shoot and compare because that was me. Like, I was like, do we really need this? Like, is it going to be different? And when I shot with it, it was different. So yeah, I, like, I mean, okay, you're yeah, also shooting, here. do you see it more for your, I don't know what you use for your aerial shots or if you use more landscapes, which are unbelievable. Um, so I can almost see without a doubt, the more information you have in a landscape, um, mm-hmm. the better. You know, yeah. people, can, people can argue when you're shooting portraits, you're shooting people, um, street, you know, how much do you need 40 megapixel? Um, yeah. I think also you, people just get accustomed to what they're shooting and they learn to shoot with it. Yeah. And if it's 40, if it's 40, if it's a uh, 64, you know, Sony, whatever that camera has, people, you know, you shoot it, you shoot it the same way. Yeah, I mean... Um, mm-hmm. I hear that to a point, but I feel like once you kind of try something, it's hard to go back. You know, it's like once you yeah. have 40 megapixels, do you want to go back to 24 megapixels or? Well, and, and that's kind of like a point that I, I, I'd i made that's like for me, granted, it's like, you know, photography is everything in my life. And it's kind of like for me, it's like if I want to make a photograph, the idea is I would love to use whatever tool I have in my availability to make the highest quality photograph for me in the long run. And especially, I think that's like the argument people may have with film versus digital, where it's like, you know, a, a negative could always be rescanned at this high quality and this great thing is where a digital file is, whatever the output is at that time, like that's kind of like what you have to work with and that's kind of it. So I don't know, I just always looked at it as like, I would love to just create photos as best I can with the highest quality tool that I, I can get my hands on. Well, I, I think I we love both that. different. Yeah, we both definitely subscribe to that, uh, to that theory. And I think, uh, you know, obviously some amazing photos were made with twelve megapixel cameras, eight megapixel. You know, mm-hmm. back in yeah. the day. Um, Depends on the look. Like I love the look of my M9. I won't get rid of it. It's eighteen megapixels, and like I look at the quality of the images out of that thing, and I'm constantly blown away i still can't i mm-hmm. still can't believe how freaking good it is today i said to adam because <laughs> we were talking about gear stuff and i said would you sell your m9 he goes hell no <laughs> yeah the 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 leica boutique in sammy's camera out here they because I, I heard you guys talking about that prior on a prior episode and they have an m9 and i just saw though that leica uh, just formally announced that they're not repairing yeah not you want to get them you, you want to fall in love with color again that's the camera to go with. I mean, as a film guy, you start yeah. shooting with an M9 and it's like it takes you right back because the color, it doesn't look like anything else. And it also, because of the CCD sensor paired mm-hmm. with the Leica glass, there's kind of like, there's a look. There's still a look. And, that, and speaking of look, that's like something that I've also been, you know, thinking about, you know, the M10 versus the R because I was just having a conversation with another Leica shooter about the SL and he had the SL he bought the SL2 and then he got rid of it and now he only shoots with two SLs because he feels that the SL original has more of the Leica look, the more of the pop than uh-huh. the SL2. And he prefers it. Even though he could have the SL2, he, he prefers the SL. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's... Um, Digital's an interesting space because I think it's just all interpretation and like what, you know, what... I guess works for some people, what makes sense to them, you know? So, I mean, 
both those both the SLs are great cameras. Um, but the M10R, as far as like colors, I recently uh, maybe I'll send you guys the photos. I don't know if you guys edit photos ever into your visual part of uh, the podcast, but I just that, shot like these cool. kind of like leftover abandoned cars uh a couple of the shots were made with the m10r and like i when i do digital processing like the idea is like don't do much if it, anything to it like you know digital like don't make it look like anything it's it's its own it's its own um medium so you don't you know and that made it easier for me to work in digital space it was like when you try to make it look like something else that's where you're, you might be going wrong like just embrace what you got and kind of like use it that's how I feel when I'm working on M- M9 files that I, I, I almost feel like I don't need to stop myself from making it something it's not. Mm-hmm. It, I, I just love what it is off the bat. And I feel even with the M10 color, I have to, some, I, you know, I, I, I give a little bit of look whether I'm shooting a wedding and I want to, mm-hmm. I, I, I wish everything I shot looked like film. The M9 mm-hmm. files are just a little bit more vibrant and a little bit sharper. A little punchier. They're, yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you don't really need to, to screw around with the color. Fine when you start tweaking stuff, you're, you get lost. And you're, you, then you hit reset and you're like, oh, that looks so much better. Yeah. It's that. interesting. You know, you do what, that before and after. Yeah. What? Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of film, because it seems like that's kind of where your heart is at. Um, what, what, do you, what do you love to shoot with? If you're you in shoot more medium format you do a lot of mostly 35 um and how does that kind of work into your um i mean i, I would i would say like 90 percent 35 i have a couple of like um hasselblad cameras or like a fuji 645 mm-hmm. uh but I, I i love medium format and i think just going back to the m system it's great to like pick up a film m and the familiarity is there so if you go to a digital m it's still there so it's all relative yeah same glass um, same Yep. Yeah, just it's it's just like it's it's a motor skill after years, you know, working with rangefinders and like you know, the viewfinder, everything. It's just all motor mm-hmm. skill that you keep building up. So it's like I like if I feel like shooting digital, like there's nothing to like reprogram my brain. It's kinda like just pick up and keep shooting. But yeah, yeah as far as like film stock, like if you want to like talk that like I like I said like ninety percent or what I love shooting is black and white. So I love experimenting or exploring black and white stock. So it's like mainly like triax is Always a go-to. I've uh, been a real big fan of the Ferrani P30 stuff. Um, I got. I found like when I was in New York a couple of years ago, I found like a bunch of like well-kept bricks of the the Kodak uh, 400 BWCN. Mm-hmm. So some of that stuff. Um, but yeah, try to keep it simple. Like you know, don't overwhelm myself too much. Are you processing or are you sending? No, it I, I I I tried. <laughs> I tried during like quarantine. Like, oh, I have this time. Like, let me explore that and. It was fun. I got a couple of rolls done, but I realized like I just like making photographs more than the chemistry and more than the developing. And yeah, um, I'm sure I saved some money, but like for me, it's my time. Like if the lab can, you know, do take care of what I'm shooting, then I can go back to yeah, making more photographs. That that's my whole thing. Yeah, that makes who do you send it to? Someone out in LA? Uh, just Sammy's. I've been going Sammy's, there for okay. years, and yeah. you know, like I, I just get the negatives processed, so they get usually a day. I'll get my my negatives back, and then and you then, scan them. Yeah. And what's yeah. your workflow with that? What do you use to scan your thirty five? Uh, scanning with thirty five. Um, let's see. I think you could let's see. Is it over that way? No, this way. Yeah. So, uh, Flex Tight X one, I scan mainly with. Uh, I'll, I just got a pack on. What I'm is that? So much thirty. What's that? What is what is that? I've never I've never seen that. That? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> dude. So, um, am I going to regret yeah, asking what that is? Yeah, I Dan's regret- going to be I, on I, eBay I, in a second. So I'm looking at my I, Nikon five thousand, which is what I use. Okay, the, the I, I have the thing. I have the nine thousand too. Okay, so you could. Um, yeah. So let's trade yeah, five thousand so like- for the nine thousand. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, so what happened was, uh, I knew this guy, Michael, I know who worked at, um, uh, K&M camera in New York. Mm-hmm. I was talking about like, just like, this is like three or four years ago, talking about like just scanning with silver fast on the Epson. And he, he's like a big film guy. So he's like, Oh, like, have you ever used an Imacon? And I was like, no, oh, like, okay. what's that? Yeah. So if you know Imacon, then it's the same. It's the Hustle same Blood bottom and yeah, and okay. just rebranded it. So I went oh. down that rabbit hole of like, what is this? And then started doing the research and then one day i just like i'll buy it from b and h and see if there's a huge difference of course, and, and it's not, if not then I'll, yeah 
but I, I bought it and uh, about three years ago, I think, and now I'm stuck with it. Like uh, it's just uh, it, it, it does it, 35 and 120. Yeah, or, four by five, oh, eight really? by ten. Yeah, it does it does everything? Yeah. Is it vertical? It's interesting. So it's a vertical. It's, it's like a vir- it's a virtual drum scanner. So the 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 lens faces downward, which oh. you get less dust on your mm-hmm. you know your lens or when you're scanning. And then the film holders um, here are like this. So the film holders bend. Oh, so when it so goes cool. in, it rotates and oh. curves. So when you get a scan, you're getting the sharpest point of every image. Okay. Um, I think we need to hang up right now because Dan literally <laughs> has to change his shorts and now get on eBay. I've, uh, I have seen the Emicons. Um Yeah. So, I mean, like, I, was, I was like, is this mm-hmm. really a thing? But like look I also the, do a lot of the wheels turning over here. <laughs> I, I, I do I do a lot of printing myself too, and like that's a big factor as far as like going back to quality size of images. Is that like when I you know I want to be able to print big if I ever feel like it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you then, did, like you do digital printing. Yeah, yeah, digital yeah, printing. Yeah, okay. no, 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 no. I'm just I'm just trying to I'm trying <laughs> no, to. I was just make say, gear, like you know? I, yeah, I mean, I I think the idea is if I win the lottery, just buy some kind of like ranch house somewhere and just take my time and do everything that I want to do, whether it's like darkroom printing, enlarging and self-developing. But for right now, just, you know, with, just with the ferris on that every eyeball with, you know, little pen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Uh, so yeah, digital printing. Um, I just always want the option to be able to print as big and as best as I can. Um, and this scanner kind of helped me see that, you know, it, it helped me sh- approach shooting film in a different way. Cause now when you have, whether it's um, I've seen a lot of people really hyped about the negative supply co like uh yeah oh, yeah yeah so so it's like I think if you're able to obtain the highest quality form scan of your negative then like you're kind of shooting digital like anyway it's weird you know it's um you're it's you're kind of like you're the reper- idea of like you know recording music you you know you re- you could record on tape whatever but you're still gonna like mix it on digital and then create a digital copy. Yeah. So unless yeah. you unless you're a total purist and you mix, you know record on tape, <laughs> mix on tape, and then you just print yeah. it on vinyl, you know it's still there's going to be a digital conversion, an analog to digital conversion at some point. But if the source material yeah. mostly analog, yes, it, yes. So speaking of that, do you have you shot with the M10 monochrome at all? Yeah, yeah. I I, I bought that. I think you you're in a, you got uh, you had the similar situation. I bought it literally the beginning of March. I, before yeah, I, before everything mm-hmm. I, I i know the guys that like us or boston and like i was texting with the, the manager i was like hey do you happen to have one of these he was actually we do i think the they announced never ask he's like because <laughs> like, like, they, like they had just announced um on the first like special version of it so he's like all the ones that we had on hold now people want the newer one yeah yeah so it's like mm-hmm. they, we have these ones and i'm like all right and I've worked with the uh, since the M9 monochrome in like 2013. Mm-hmm. So like I love that system. I was like, fuck, and I but just how vast, back at all. How vastly different is it? The M10 monochrome? Yeah, right? I mean, dude, it's it, that was like the first four right cuz like shooting with that for a couple months and when it's like you want to shoot with the M10R, it's like okay, like I've I've kind of gauged what this one does in black mm-hmm. and white, so like mm-hmm. I had the anticipation of what Cuz I've had the M9M, the M2, the 246. And I mm-hmm. felt like those, the M9M had, I preferred the M9M look of it. Obviously, the versatility wasn't there. Character, um, though. Yeah, but the character on, of, that, of the M9M was really mm-hmm. special. And, and I probably at some point might pick one up again once I start yeah. working again. Um, and, but, but then I got the M10M, it, it like floored me with, yeah. I was confused a little bit. <laughs> with like, I was, I was, I was not expecting files like that Such i wasn't either thing. and i mean it's 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 a powerful camera like that's all I can say. it's a powerful tool this you know the sharpness the detail like the detail and for me felt a little bit reminiscent of the m9 monochrome the detail yeah and then when you shoot at the low iso is at the base was it 100 or 160 160 uh, yeah. 160 it's like to me it's like the smoothness and silkiness of a medium format of mm-hmm. like it and then if you want to get into the 35 millimeter tri-x hp5 it's you know probably going to 6400 you know 3200 to get a yeah. little character into it i found when, what i see in those m10m files is the blacks have such an incredible they're almost like charcoal like they just have like a 
an incredible look to them that mm -hmm. I think is a lot richer than the blacks that were in like the 246. Um, and I feel like the the nine is like the M9 monochrome is kind of in its own league, so it's hard to compare the two. But I recently mm -hmm. was kind of given a an option to trade my M10P. And I recently cash. he this morning. Yeah, just you know, for for an M10M, and I'm just like, and it's like new in the box, like it hasn't. It's like not even like the the piece of tape is still over like the thing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, uh. <laughs> I'm so tempted. Just before we got on, he goes, "No, I'm going to keep my M10P, and I'll do the sensible thing. I'll buy a backup SL, and you know, and some more glass." But yeah. he, he calls me when he wants to hear why he should be getting the M10M. Yeah, because Dan's not the voice of reason. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can be, but I, I, I enable. You know, I enable everyone. Yeah. He's an uh, enabler, and he's a yenta. Yeah, yeah it, it's uh, the, the, the whole design philosophy, I think, with Leica is it's an interesting rabbit hole once you start, like, going down it and getting into it. Like, it's that, – that's what happened to me. And I think it's just – I think what I've tried to suggest to people is that, like, especially with the M system in an age where everything is, like, autofocus and so much is done for you, that even the option to make digital photos but inject yourself so much so that, like, you're the one focusing – you're the one doing the settings like that's a that's an integral and fun part of making pictures you know so it's like if, adam, if yeah adam was telling me he was out in, in the city the other day with his m10 and his 35 fle and he showed me a photo he goes look at that focus man i was i was <laughs> far away and what you know and i nailed it and you don't have those kind of those conversations when you're eye tracking and you could you would say oh man if it, it fucking missed i only got nine out of ten 99 per, you know well yeah and, it, you're and, more and the, the you're more engaged you have, for sure yeah yeah you, you you feel more i feel more accomplished i mean i got into leica with an m9 um in 2000 and uh 10 whenever I, I mean shortly after it came out um and it's always been a staple in whether I was shooting Nikon at the time, I always had it now I'm fully, um, mm -hmm. you know, went to the eye tracking love affair and then hated it. Um, but I just got my M3 back from, be from being serviced. And I just like, mm -hmm. you know, cocked the shutter, heard it. And especially the viewfinder, the M3, it's, it's so special. Mm -hmm. I, I the, it feels better than, than my M6. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously the M6 is, because I love shooting film, you know, not obviously, but, you know, uh, over the last two years, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And over the last year, I've been developing, mostly out of boredom, uh, but interested because I never did it before. I never took classes. I never, I didn't learn on film. So mm -hmm. me, it's, it's still, you know, it still has that like romantic feeling. Um, if I'm doing it professionally, I'm going to send it out. Um, and I actually need to find a new lab because I didn't love uh my black and whites i got back from this uh this other lab hmm. so i showed it to adam he's like mm, it looks it looks cooked it lo you know as soon as i looked at it i'm like i'm so accustomed to dan's work being like kind of really smooth and creamy and it like it just looked cooked like the blacks were too it just looked gray and muddy and i know because mm -hmm. i used to do like I, I i started on black and white you know i had my own dark room back in back in college um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh I, I know exactly that feeling you know when you overcook it it just there's nothing you can do there's no way to reciprocate it's just it's done and yeah it sucks when the lab does it because you're you know things going to do it right but um in, in, unless the lab really kind of truly knows your style and you give them specific mm -hmm. instructions and you like to push or pull yeah but they, the yeah, they got to do a good job on the first one for you to build that relationship with them well you know shit happens so, i mean maybe the operator yeah. was hung over or something <laughs> um, so back to the M10M. Yeah, um, he has an agenda and he's going to stick to it. Yeah. So, so do well, I sell? Do I sell the M10P to this guy? Because literally, he it's new in the box, and my my M10P with a, some cash, it's not a huge outlay, would get me an M10M. I I mean, my thing is, if you love black, like that's what it comes down to. If you love black and white work, like. And you want that extra umph and detail and everything? Like I would say, yeah. I mean, if, ah. it, but it's only if you love black and white. I do. I, mean, I do. Do you I do. love black so, and white, I mean, Adam? 
do love black and white. Yeah, because I mean, like, I even took it like so. Like, part of like my my joy is like I've been doing aerial photography for maybe six years now. So it's like my one of my tests is if I ever get a new camera of any kind, film or digital, like I go up and try to shoot. So with the M M10 monochrome and those like massively high ISO capabilities, I was like, okay, like I'm gonna test this. So I flew up and aerial photography at night is the hardest thing ever because you're even if you're at a slow hover, you're still vibrations, you're moving. Chances are you got to open up the f-stop all the way to like one four to you know two to try to get you know enough light in there. I went up and shot this thing at a hundred ISO and got more than usable images from it. Like I was blown away. Hundred, hundred, hundred thousand. Hundred thousand ISO. Hundred thousand. Yeah. Okay, okay. That's that's insane. Yeah. That's absolutely. I mean, look, I I don't shoot a whole lot of high ISO stuff. Um, I don't either. Like I try to treat the digital like a film ISO like. 6400 is like the max that like i ever feel i really need but given the this technological advance of what it is i was like oh let me just play with it and test well, it and see what the first week the first do. week i had it i it was before all the covid and i was at a bar doing um a shoot and i was shooting at 40,000 at one at one four and mm -hmm. yeah maybe i was at 500th of a second 750 like i didn't have to be that high but part of it was testing it out and mm -hmm. it was gorgeous it was it was mm -hmm. shots that i could not have gotten with the m9m with the even maybe with the 246 like 8000 that's really where I, I i would cap that um so it it like shocked me and it becomes a, i really think it becomes a different camera once you hit us go past a certain iso just mm -hmm. actually was, brought up on your instagram that um 100,000 iso frame of the stable oh stable yeah center yeah it's, it's Freaking sick, dude. I mean, how one was that? A hundred thousand. The city is glowing, which it's just gorgeous. And the fact that like Staples Center is so sharp, like there's no question about it. Like it's it's insane. I mean, like that's that's a that's a wall hanger all day long, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it, that. That's so what I was saying. It was fun to go up and shoot. I was like, wow, like you know, because like you you see cameras like all these every new digital camera advertises like you know some hundred thousand whatever number iso chances are if it's in color you probably you're gonna have to do a ton of work to like make it a usable photograph shot at that uh but that's the beauty of the monochrome without that tray and you know shooting at that it's like it's definitely usable it's you know for for the what it is and even the color uh if i scroll a little bit down those floral shots and I think mm. you were shooting on slide film. Slide film for those. I did shoot some. I don't think I posed them. But I did. I did shoot some digital stuff too with the M10R and the SL2. Uh, yeah, the the Lotus stuff was was fun yeah. to explore. But I was I was using like um, an R6 with like some of those shots or mixture of R6 with like a 500 millimeter lens mm -hmm. or 350, and then some other shots were the Thambar you know, just on an MP with whatever uh, black and white film stock, Ferrania P30 most likely. That's awesome. I, I love photographers that have an arsenal of cameras and tools and they're like, you know, I'm going to, I want to do this project. I, I'm going out today to do this. I, I'm going to take this camera. I'm going to take, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can respect having your go-to and you know, your, I, I have this camera and this is what I use and you go out and do mm -hmm. everything with it. But even knowing me and my camera gear, my selection, it's if I want to take this, if I'm in this mood today, I'm going to see what I can do with this camera mm -hmm. and vice versa. And, you know, if you want to be in medium format, 35 millimeter, if you want to be digital, what kind of digital, only black and white, uh, have the colors of an M9, do I want, you know, having all those options, it's obviously a... Uh, uh, it's nice to have a lot of tools. It's, it's, to it's, a, it's, it's a blessing, but it's also, you know, with whatever tools you have, um, whether it's a point and shoot, a phone, I mean, you can, what I, I that the toughest them. call is like making the, uh, the choice, you know, like, what are you walking out of the house with? If you're going to bring one camera and one lens. And, um, I think with an M body, it's easier to make that choice because you know, you kind of know that you're going to get something special kind of, no matter what you have in your hands, you know, mm -hmm. with an SLR that does everything for you. It, it, there's so much, there's so many more variables and you're, you're, mm -hmm. you've got too many options. Whereas like, if you know, you leave the house and you've got like your M10 M and a 35, that's what you're going to get. 
and it's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. and You're going to be happy with that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's interesting. I also feel like with M bodies, it's um, when you get a new one or you, or not a new one or you get it when you use, but it's new to you or you open the box and it's fresh. There's a feeling that I have over those bodies, a, a emotional connection that I just, um, I just traded and with some extra cash and got an SL2 yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and it's great. It, it's, it's an unbelievable camera. I don't feel that like emotional. I wasn't holding it on the couch all night. You know, just, <laughs> just you know, we're watching. We're yeah. watching. My wife and I are uh, watching Bravo, weird. and no, my wife, my wife and I are watching Bravo. And like when I get a new camera, I'm just getting to know the men. You know, I'm just as watching holding under, it, messing it below deck. No, that, those are only on Tuesdays, man. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, what are we watching? Uh, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills now. So I'm 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 extra zoning out, even though I I love uh I love my Bravo, but wow, look you at know, you. I do. So, um, Steph, I was uh, like, I gotta go. I gotta go. No, no. I mean, it's. I, I always love talking photography. You guys obviously have your, your, your uh, bond over banter. You know, so I'm, I'm cool with it. You know. Um. So, as far as like, um, how do you go about approaching this stuff? Because obviously, a lot of this that you're doing, you're kind of self-assigning yourself, self-assigning mm -hmm. yourself. You're self-assigning. You know, if you're gonna go out and do aerial stuff, you're gonna hire a helicopter. You're going to go out in LA for, what is it, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or 20 minutes, whatever you get. You're going to obviously do everything in your power to make sure that you, the conditions are right. Um, but um, do you do a lot of commercial assignments, or is it mostly like you're shooting this and doing it for the fine art? Like, what's kind of like your, your thing? Um, so I guess as far as like, so I'm trying to think, like maybe like 2012, I grew up, I come from a skateboarding background, not in photography, but just like I grew up skateboarding. Um, and then, you know, uh, got into photography and then kind of like had these opportunities around 2012 to start doing uh, a lot of projects for skateboard companies and streetwear brands. So like I started photos of mine would be on boards and t-shirts and all this kind of stuff. So I had like maybe like a solid like year, year and a half of that. Um, and I'd done projects with um, brands like Skate Mafia, um, Venture Trucks, Huff, um, The Hundreds, like all these companies. So one day someone was like, you should just start your own clothing skateboard company since you just did it for everybody else. I started uh, a company called Visual about seven years ago. The idea of the company is primarily based with photography. Uh, and design so you know obviously i would just share my photos on t-shirts and hoodies and etc branched out to me start working with other photographers on collaborative projects featuring their photos on boards and you know giving them like royalty options on like what would sell and what would be good um and then in the last three years we've launched our own pro skateboarding team for visual um so that's kind of where it's at so that's like the 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 day job for me which is still what i do i have a business partner that i work with so he kind of manages like, you know, uh, fulfillment and day to day kind of stuff. And I try to do more of the creative networking um, of, of sorts with it. So that allowed me to not necessarily have to chase constantly chase uh, commercial gigs. But now I could kind of explore stuff on my own. And when a commercial opportunity does arise, I'm not pressed to take it just because like I have to kind of be really intrigued with it. That's incredible. Dude, that, that sounds so awesome. And, and I'm just looking at your skateboarding at the visual um, mm -hmm. right yeah. now. It's so rad. I love it. I love the whole idea of it. I love the idea of the, uh, the photos being licensed on your boards. And it's, it's funny, a friend of mine, a photographer I know in the city has, has done that. He's done a bunch of his photos on boards and it looks, mm -hmm. it looks amazing. So um, huge fan. I yeah, it's, up, uh, it's 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 a, it's a fun outlet, you know. I think like for photography, that was like the the wrecking the the realized moment where it's like, I think we we kind of like get instilled of like this traditional sense of like how you show images, which is through prints and frames and galleries, but it's also explored beyond that to you know uh, wearables and other hard goods that like people can still appreciate and use if they feel like using them, like in the sense of a skateboard or if they can hang it on their wall. Um, you know, it's like it, it showed that don't look so uh, close minded at opportunities. Dude, if I was 15 again skating, I would get that picture of that girl in the thong, right? 
I was thinking, I think so. Yeah, the, 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 the lingerie, I think. Yeah. I mean, your 15 year old, I mean, I'm just thinking back. What did I have? I had a uh, Jeff Rowley boards or chocolate oh, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. you know, um, all that stuff. Yeah. I feel like it, you were so, it was so pigeonholed and limited. Alien workshop was a little more out there. Um, yeah. But oh God, I'm so old. <laughs> when I was skateboard, I I had a crip stick when I was skateboarding. Adam had oh, wow, Converse yeah, up high, and he was you know. I mean, I had I had a foam fiberglass crip stick, which was like the board I saved up for, with um, indie trucks, and I had those big, fat, soft, like seventies, um, mm-hmm. with Sims gold bearings, and man, you could you could fly on those things. I That's mean, all you were doing. You were flying. You weren't you weren't jumping off anything though. Oh, you could jump board. off a of shit. You just you know we we did more of like. I mean, we used to, yeah, we we would go miles to go to the record store on those things. <laughs> Just a bunch of stop by the candy kids. shop, yeah, soda shop, yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's a solid setup, though. Sounds like. Yeah, it was it was pretty good. I remember it was. I mean, look, I beat the shit out of that board, and then I remember I threw it on eBay a bunch of years ago to buy some guitar gear. And like, I was getting messages from people like all over the world, like, dude, I'll buy it from you now for this and that. And it sold for a hell of a lot more than I paid for it. I'll say that. I'm sure. Sure. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, so the visual, that's like, that's where it, it, it enabled me. So it's like, I'm kind of like exploring photography on my own, but then it's also like being able to piece things together for, for the, the skateboard company. So. That's so rad. That was really so rad. And I like the way that, you know, the, the, uh, like the apparel brand kind of almost becomes or, or just kind of is naturally a lifestyle brand, you know, so that you can kind of take all of your passions and kind of like wrap them into one thing, mm-hmm. um, which, which really kind of gives it more impact, you know, so that you're not just hawking goods, but mm-hmm. um, that there's, there's a whole kind of a story and a vibe behind it because, you know, to, if you're into skateboarding you want the whole vibe i mean for me back in the day skateboarding was about the lifestyle it was about punk rock mm-hmm. it was about being rebel being different you know whatever mm-hmm. so yeah i used really to go cool. back you know i used to i went to private jewish school and me and my best friends were we all skated we were all skaters and we were jenko jeans and you know uh then it kind of became i'd go back to school shopping at the skate at the skateboard mm-hmm. shop in uh you know on route 17 in jersey okay that's where you know you. Go, that's I bought my sneakers. I got my pants. Got my fresh jive and yeah, know, <laughs> Stussy, uh, all that shit. Um, but th- those are the be- those are the best times. Just I mean, for me, it was playing music and skating with my friends. And we had film. Well, there's always one guy that we had, one of our good friends that had a long board, and he didn't really want to do any tricks with it. You know what I mean? So he like was the guy that filmed all of us on this. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, you'll never track. once catch me doing an ollie. I never even tried. <laughs> that, that's like, what I was saying. With your board, you're not doing that. You're just no, man. But we like look. If there was like a bunch of stairs, like you know, we would go down them or jump you'd, them, whatever. You'd flip the board up, catch it, and walk down the stairs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then you get the girl. <laughs> yeah, no, no. There were never any, uh, there were never any girls around. Come on, there was never girls. There were never girls. No skateboarding. No, <laughs> no never. Thing. Are you still? <laughs> do you still like skateboard? Do you hit the the skate park yourself? I, 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 I go out with the team guys a bit. I'll roll around. Um, I just turned 40 this year. So it's like, not to sound like an old man, but it's like compared to when I was 20, the ability to skate and like the impact of, wow, like I forgot how many, how many like different muscles are used for this. So it's like, it takes me a few days to kind of recover back a bit. But yeah, I, I roll around on the board, but mainly it's like the, the best thing I, I, I learned was photography. Like the same excitement I got through skateboarding at 12, I started doing photography at 21, 22. And like, it was the same exhilaration as skateboarding was. So Mm -hmm. I just transcend that energy into photography. So it's it's the same thing when I go out with the guys and they're skating around, I have that sense of uh, fun and excitement, but just on the idea of making photos with them. That's awesome. I I totally relate to that. I think that, I think the thing is that Daniel and I like forged this whole thing about our passion for photography, because even though that we work as photographers, we like to play as photographers. Like, you know, like there's never a time when we don't want to think about photography. We don't, you know, Mm -hmm. we're not going to go somewhere without a camera. You know, there are photographers that I know that like they shoot professionally and then they don't have like, let's say a walk around camera. They don't want to take pictures Hmm. if they're not working. And I I don't know that just fundamentally goes against my core um, because I just, I can't not. 
Um, and it seems like you seem to be the same way. Like there's nothing that you, that's off limits for, for you with photography. Well, I, I think like uh, the way I viewed, for, viewed photography was kind of like um, a lot of people go through their life and they never want to find like a thing that they just love doing. And what I mean by that is just like something you like you do by, you can do by yourself. The afterthought of doing it isn't, Oh, how much money am I going to make from this? How popular or famous am I going to get from it? You discover something that gives you a sense of um, self-fulfillment. And like, that's a very pure thing in life. And if you discover it, it's like important to like, not, not in a sense, whore it out, you know? So it's like, I think as long as you can keep that pure, like that's a very great thing. Cause I mean, I see a lot of people who I know or people, you know, you come across and you can tell they don't have that thing in their life. And they, you know, you, you can see when they're trying to talk to you about like how much you love what you're doing. Um, so for photography, that was, that was it for me. It's like the idea that I go, go out with this tool or this camera and make photographs and come back and just like, whether I made one photograph or a hundred that day, like I just feel so fulfilled in the act of doing it that like, it's just, a, it's a really pure love for it. It's a lucky thing. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I was, uh, Adam and I were both, but separately, um, I was in a band for 10 years and did that with my best friends who I skated with in, in, in fifth grade, sixth grade. I mean, like my lifelong friends, we were lucky enough to be able to be in a band together. Um, and I got into photography towards the end of, of touring, just as documenting and learning. Um, but this feeling I have when I take a photo and it was, it was a town, ta- I'm going to say a a talent or uh, a passion because you could whatever um, that I didn't know I had for photography. I always knew I was a visual person. Movies always kind of were special to me. Um, and mm-hmm. I thought when I was leaving music, I was like, that's, you know, I left it because I found this other thing that was only mine and, mm-hmm. and, pri- and private. Um, and so I was, I felt less, so I understand, you know, going from something you probably felt you feel you find nothing like skating to mm-hmm. finding photography. Um, it's a lucky, mm-hmm. it's a lucky situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you, um, were there other careers for you beside uh, photography? Cause you said you found that. Oh, in I mean, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I mean like my, my, my background, it, it, this might be interesting for you guys. Um, so my background went like this. So, Grew up skateboarding, did a little bit of sponsored skateboarding, like never turned pro or anything, but like, you know, got to do a couple tours and travel a little bit for contests and stuff. So I was 21 and I was um, kind of reaching that crossroads point at that young part of everyone's life. Okay, well, what do I really want to do? I tried going to like, you know, a semester of college, like community college, and I wasn't into it. Um, the younger generation skating behind us was like so far more advanced than like my friends and I, that was like, okay, pro skateboarding isn't going to happen. Cause like these dudes are like the next generation of guys. So I was running, a, excuse me, I was running a skateboard camp for kids one summer and this gentleman had his three sons enrolled in my camp. They were eight, 11 and 12, you know, cool little kids. They knew me from the area. So I think the dad took an interest in me that they thought I was cool or something. Uh, and then I'd come to find out their dad owns an adult film company. Cause I mean, this is LA and this is the Valley, right? Blew my mind because he didn't strike me as the kind of guy that would own such a company. So he asked me one day, he goes, Hey, like, I want to talk to you about a project. I'm like, okay, well, what's this? And he goes, I want to make a skateboarding adult film and I want you to produce it. So I'm 21. I'm like, well, what, what does that mean? Like, what, what is it? Like, Don't worry. Like, you're not getting on camera. You're not doing anything. Goes, but I want, you to get skateboarders to like have cameos in it to like, you know, find locations and like do all this stuff. Cause if I'm going to do it, I want it to be cool within the skateboard community, not just like another bad adult movie. So at 21, I don't know where I'm going, but I know this guy's really nice. He's great. I know there's money in that industry. So I'm like, okay. And it involves, I was already intrigued with like video stuff. Cause my friends and I would make skate videos and sell them and like that kind of stuff, film each other. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll take this opportunity up and see where the hell it goes. So I do the project. It does well for him. And he goes, hey, do you want to come work for me? Your, half, your time will be split being a personal assistant to me and scanning in negatives for our website. So that was like the first job job that I really had where I'm like, okay, I got a place I'm going to like nine to five every day. Granted, it's like a whole other world. Comes to me like a, 
six months, eight months later and says, Hey, like you should do skate videos. Do you want to try directing? And like at this point I'm 22 and I'm just like, okay, like I'll, I'll keep going down this rabbit hole. So I would start doing these productions, booking makeup artists, booking locations, like all this different stuff. I would have to book a photographer. So the photographer, if his schedule was booked, I would have to reschedule everything else around him. I love photography being exposed from skateboard magazine. So I just asked my boss at the time, I was like, Hey, if I bought my own camera, can I just shoot all the photos myself? Which to me is like gnarly that like a guy would entrust a 22 year old kid with like, you know, 20, $30,000 budget who doesn't know photography at that moment to go shoot photos. So that was where that, that, that was the, I'm not pausing this by any means, please. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to finish. That wasn't the photography budget. No, no, no. That okay. was like the overall movie budget. Like, okay. I mean, like, I think like, like I would get maybe like okay. 1500 bucks for Yeah, like but that's 1500 but... extra that you, on top of directing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So please continue. That, <laughs> so that was where I, okay. So it started out as a job really taking the camera out, but okay. Now I bought like, you know, uh, I think it was like a Canon 10 D and I had like a Canon film SLR cause this film was still like the primary use for it. Digital mm-hmm. just, started to come out and I would go skate with friends or I would go travel and the cameras kept coming with me and shooting and shooting and shooting more and more. Um, so I probably spent about like nine or 10 years working within that industry. And I just got to the point where like, I realized I wasn't happy cause I did go through like waves of like making great money in that industry. And then like, it was interesting cause then you have like all the free stuff come out like the tube site. So it's like, no one's paying mm-hmm. for that stuff really at that time. So I, it, was, it was a realization for me where it's like, okay, no matter what your job is, take the money out of the equation, which you still want to do it. So for me, I think half of it was, okay, the money's gone. The stuff that made me feel like, oh, this is a, a, a fulfilling thing that I'm doing. But when it left, I was like, okay, well, do I want to be 50 doing this? I want to be 60. I was like, no, like photography is like this love. Like I'd rather see where this takes me mm-hmm. before or, you know, before it's too late in life for me to say, I wonder what if or wonder what would have happened. It's pretty awesome. And you're pretty lucky that you made that discovery at the age that you did, that you didn't end up like so many people that find themselves, you know, in 45, 50 years old, they've, they're kind of doing the same thing. And like, you know, somebody like you rolls in, you know, you're having drinks and dinner and it's like, Hey, meet my friends to fun. And you start talking about what you're doing. You're like, fuck, you know, I've been at the same job since college for 25 years. And like, Mm-hmm. I haven't done anything like that. And like, you know, it's it, whatever it's, it, you know, so it's lucky that you found it and you pursued it and you, you followed your heart and look where you are now, which is just awesome. And I think that that's, you know, some people just, you know, like a lot of people want to become photographers and I, I say, Hey, become a photographer. But um, if you're going to do it professionally, you know, it, there's a lot more to it than just, you know, being talented at photography and being able to combine, you know, the art and commerce together is really impressive and the thing that's really you know obviously impressive about your work is that it 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 has a very commercial feel in that you know i could see a lot of this being used in multitudes of different ways but like you said you are not incumbent to people in the way that you're shooting you know you're not just Uh shoot everything is not on brand you're not shooting it just because like you you know the art director told you to go out and do this stuff um that you're doing it for your own thing and 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 look, you know, 500 and something thousand people. Agree. Well, I, well, I, th- I think, I think it's important too. Cause like, I think, um, you know, there, there, there's been the boom of social, uh, platforms and, you know, obviously Instagram for photography. And it's been an, an, an interesting science experiment, I think in the realms of photography, the past eight or nine years with it, you know, because, uh, it, it's, it's that dopamine thing, right? You, if someone makes one type of photograph, that gets a way better response than everything else. They just want to like rinse and repeat, which is terrible. Cause I think like if you're a new photographer and you're exploring something like three years in, like now you're, you're, you're boxing yourself in to the point where it's like, I've, I've met photographers over years that like they would never post this type of photograph cause it's not on brand for themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think it's like when you, when you start going down that hole, it's, it's, it's dangerous. Cause for me, it's like, you should be trying and exploring all this different stuff and sharing it if you feel like it. Like you shouldn't feel so controlled by the audience that you've cut yourself off from any explorative options. Like that, yeah. that's, you know, that, that's something that I think we see a lot of. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's just why, why would people, you not? Sorry about that. 
<laughs> marketing people would be like, oh no, you know, you have to, you know, you know, you have to curate 30 images that are, you know, speak to the kind of work that you want to, you know, put out there so that the people that are hiring you're going to see that. And like, I don't agree. It's it's the same thing like on your job description or your resume. It's like if, you know, if you were previously a Starbucks manager, that probably means that you're really great with people, that you're good at managing time. Like you probably have a lot of talents that can translate into a, a lot of other things. And, you know, looking at somebody's work that's well-rounded, you know, you can see like, okay, if I gave them this task, I can see from the kinds of things that they do that they're going to give it a fresh look. They haven't done whatever that this thing is like 6,000 times that they're going to, they're not going to give me a rinse and repeat that there's going to be something potentially fresh to, to put on there. Yeah. And that's how it should be. Cause I think, um, you know, Instagram became this place of photographers, like, you know, Oh, like this guy does this. Like it was just like the quickest way to like describe someone's photo. Oh, this person only shoots black and white. This person only shoots this. Like, but then it's like, it's like so limiting because even in the sense of like branding or work options, they're going to say like, Oh, like that guy only shoots this. Like, so when we have a project that requires that, like we'll hit them up. But it's like, even like, I know a guy who does a lot of, um, you know, fashion week stuff like in Paris and New York and all over. He primarily shoots like all the women's shows. And I was talking to him. I was like, do you ever go out for men's? He goes, no. He goes, for some reason, they don't think I can shoot men's fashion. Like it's only women. So it's like, you know, like you can, you can fall into that hole and, and it's so restricting. So for me, it's like, make, make photographs that are like, it's just, it's just surface level and taste level. Some people may just want to like skim through and see like, what can they take away from a 30 second scroll? And then other people who have a deeper sense will like look at what you're actually doing and like observe what you're doing and process it and then make a conclusion from there. So it's just two types of people who are going to be looking at your pictures. So speaking of that, I'm a little intrigued. Like you, you do have like over half a million followers, which is incredible. I mean, that's, that's impressive in any regard. 50,000 is impressive. And um, was that something that happened like quickly? Is it something that you kind of set out to build? I mean, um, I mean, to be honest with you, it's like, so like, so going on to that, like continuing that story um, about with photography, right? So I, I leave the adult business. Um, the directing name that I had during that time was called Van Styles. So I don't know. It was just like a nickname. It was like, it became a nickname. Like people are like, oh, it doesn't sound like someone who directs adult movies. Like it just sounds like an interesting thing. So like when I transitioned to photography, I kept like just going with that name. So also at the same time when I left that, I was okay. Like I'm going to explore photography. I was like, obviously I've been shooting the human form models, women, I was like, I'm going to keep shooting some of that because that's a familiar subject I, I know. Um, so I would start sharing a lot of those, those types of images primarily as I was exploring everything else. And obviously a lot of what the subject matter is, is going to garner a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. um, so between that, it was also skateboarding. Skateboarding was massively into Instagram early on that community. So like me coming from skateboarding, sharing these different types of photographs, like the word just kind of spread like, Hey, like, this guy used to skate, check him out. He shoots, he shoots, you know, beautiful women, whatever you want to phrase it as. So I actually had like, I think three or four years ago, I had like maybe close to a million followers. So a big change happened. All right. So I had a daughter that was born in 2014. My father passed like the following, like, you know, a uh, couple of years later, start just self, self wondering, you know, like, okay, well, what's my, imprint that I want to leave behind like what's the sense of legacy um and then also for me my photography was evolving and growing um you know and then that name so going back to branding and boxing yourself in under that name Van Styles that's exactly what it was like if I posted anything that wasn't women you know you you would get comments I'm like hey I don't follow you for this like where are the girls at like I would get a lot of that stuff right mm -hmm. and so you start to question, okay, like, well, what is it? Like, what is this name? Like this name, I didn't make this name. I'm going to be a photographer and go by this like stage name. I made this name at a certain point in my life. I came to this reflection that, okay, I think I've grown past this point in my life. Like that with that name where it came from, I just feel like not that I ever would doubt it, but I just feel like, okay, I've evolved past it. Um, so an interesting moment happened when um, I was already dabbling with the idea, okay, I'm going to change just go by my real name, like just abandon that branding and go by my real name. Um, and, uh, and thankfully what was a great push was from um, Kieran Canarni, who is the marketing director for Like a Camera USA. They wanted to use a photograph 
of mine to promote on social or something. She said, well, what do you want to be, go by? I'm like, well, you're in marketing. You tell me. And you know, she said like, look, like I see your photography is growing. Like there's going to be value in your real name and not this name. And so I had a discussion with her. I said, okay, devil's advocate. I dropped the branding. I'm sure I'm going to lose followers. Right. And she was just like, that's fine. Like, like, what does it matter? Like, you know, she was like, um, you know, for us, like, okay, if you have 50,000 or a hundred thousand, that's great. Like, but that's not like in our position, like that's not entirely what we're looking for. And so it had me look back at like, okay, well, what does photography mean to me? And like, you know, say as far as a platform of Instagram, like, what does that mean? Like, how do I, like, what do I want to do with it? And so I changed the name. And then like, I think just from people not paying attention and not seeing that name pop up, like, unfollowed so i had more and i still will lose followers but like i just came to a conclusion of um core audience versus big audience like you know what yeah, and i remind and i and i remind people too because all people say oh i'm so depressed like it's a unique photo that they made they're not trying to cater to what's contemporary at the moment they're shooting what they want oh i only got a hundred likes but i try to remind people because you got to remind yourself sometimes put a hundred people in front of you appreciating a photograph you did I was like, you're going to tell me that's not enough people. Like if you had a gallery showing and a hundred people came to look at one photograph, you're going to say, nah, that's not enough. Like everyone leave. I'm not going to open my doors unless it's 500. Like, no, like that's amazing. And you should be building off that audience and like, just keep doing what you're doing. Cause the thing is like, you can make photographs that are, are, that's like a pop song. You know, you guys that come from a music background. You can make a pop hit. That's great. But like, are those same people who like that pop hit going to like what you want to do in three years? Maybe not, you know? And it's like, now you're done. Like now you're the one hit wonder. Cause it's like, you couldn't evolve past that. You couldn't take the risk on yourself and like see where it went. So that's what happened to me was like, as far as the numbers game go, it's, it's, it's rad to see like people appreciate your work, but it's like, I want to preach people to appreciate my option to explore and do whatever the hell I want to do and not just say, well, you have to make this for us. Otherwise, like we're not into you, you know? I think that that level of maturity that you kind of, you it sounds like you kind of hit like a, a mental and emotional crossroads. You know, you had like this sudden joy and this traumatic loss all at once. And it probably just sent you on a, your head spinning, trying to like just find out where to go. And it probably is what maybe snapped you back to be, to really saying like my true identity is really what matters most here because those are going to be my legacy mm -hmm. and i have like such enormous respect for that i think it's 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 phenomenal to be able to have that kind of sense of self-awareness to be able to take that that risk because you know numbers the numbers game is so ridiculously overblown and people are so mm -hmm. so they're so like they're just, I don't know, they're, they're, they're just wrapped up in the numbers. And everybody has this thing called affirmation bias, where all they want is affirmation. That's why people post selfies, because they want to be told things to make them feel better. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, putting those kinds of things aside, putting your ego in check and just saying like, you know what, I need to put myself into a time of growth. And it's going, it could be painful. It could be devastating. It could be tragic. I don't know where it's going to go. To, to kind of let go of the reins like that, that, that takes a lot of freaking balls. So kudos to you, bro. No, I mean, well, I appreciate it. I mean, and that, and I know the society, I know where we're at because I have so many friends and it's like, like you said, like Instagram has turned everyone into their own brand and everyone's overly concerned with their brand that like everything has to be a certain way. And like the biggest real relief, I think it was like after changing my name was like, great. Like I just personally felt like I could do whatever I want to do now, post shoot and not feel confined or not feel anything and I, I don't know like i just always like appreciated like just demonstrating that to anyone that's like that puts so much emphasis on these social eyes and things that it's like like you can fall into a sense of depression if you're not hitting certain stuff if you're not getting enough analytics or metrics that make sense to you you know and it's like life is more than that and i think again going back to the art form of photography or anything like you fall into the branding the branding uh basket like you're just gonna keep i didn't want to make i didn't want to go through 20 years of photography making the same photograph and like right. you know and i think it's okay to like grow like that's the fun part that i realized is like you can shoot a subject matter for a year when you feel like you're done okay now i'm gonna do this like that's the freedom of photography like you don't have to do the exact same thing over and over. like i don't know i would just be so disappointed in myself i would look back i'm like okay 
same photograph, same photograph. It's like, there's nothing that like showed like me at least trying, you know? Yeah. And I think that that's part of what keeps me into it. You know, that's what made me stay with playing guitar for, for so many years and continuing to do it is the idea that if I keep pushing myself and keep kind of unlocking doors and making new discoveries and finding new things to do and new things to say, it translates the same way with photography. Like I, I'm not like satisfied and settled and be like, oh, you know, whatever. It's like I'm constantly in this pursuit. And I think that that's what makes photography so much fun is that and it, you never yeah, have and, to stop. And as soon as you get in a rut creatively, within photography, there's so much latitude. I mean, if I feel like I'm in a rut, I'll pick up a specific film camera. I'll develop it. If I fuck it up because the chemistry mm -hmm. was wrong like or if i'm in a stressed that i'll go for i'll go for a walk i'll pick up a camera i'll go for a walk i'll take a few pictures um you know it opens up my creativity to be able to have mm -hmm. you know circling back obviously to having multiple cameras and depending on a mood it it makes me a better film makes me a better digital photographer having multiple digital cameras in different styles makes me a better photographer mm -hmm. and um i shoot an sl differently than i shoot an m um and i like that i like that it's a different mindset it's not you know somebody like well i would need two of the same and for me i don't like having two of the same mm -hmm. um so that that's always helped me out when i've uh been in a creative rut because for me i also have you know i shoot a lot of weddings and i need to um, try it. I, I try not to get um, static with it. That I mm -hmm. have to go into each one with a creativity and an excitement. Obviously, not everyone is as amazing as the next, but I want to deliver to them what they're you know the the, the mm -hmm. best I the best I can do. And sometimes yeah. I'll try out different lighting. I'll I'll do some really fucking weird shit, um, because. I had, you know, five weddings in the last eight weeks and I need something new to really keep myself interested. And I mean, it's, like, uh -huh. it's a very liberating tool because it's kind of a, it's a blank slate. I mean, think about it, you know, like a roll of film, a memory card. If you think of the memory card in the same way, it's empty. You can, mm -hmm. you can put anything you want on there. You know, no, and, that, and I mean, that, and that's what it is. It's like photography and cameras, they, they, they allow you to uh, imaginatively see things and translate that through the lens. So it's like, like, that's what it's like. You don't always have to like, you know, and, and we all become uh, creatures of habit. So if we find like a shooting function or form, it's like, we'll stick with it. But it's like, like, no, like if you always shoot this, like just do the opposite. Like if you're bored of whatever you've been doing, do the opposite. Like, you know, that's the best thing I could do is like, if people say I'm, in a rut i don't know what to do i'll say okay well if you go this way to work go the other way take a different route um you know like if you feel like you've already shooting one type of thing don't even touch that shoot something completely new that you never shot before and but keep doing it to try to see like what you could find with it uh there's so many different variables that you can explore in photography whether it's focal lengths different cameras you know it's it's really great i think like that's what just people need to unlock sometimes. And we all do it where it's like, like just relax your mind, relax your eyes. And like, like you're saying, like start new, like it's a clean SD card. It's a clean roll of film. Like just whatever intrigues you, but like try to push yourself into a different direction. Like that's how you, you will see things differently. I think that's like some of the best advice you could give any photographer yeah. new or seasoned, um, especially right now, you know, during the pandemic when we're a little bit more isolated, you know, like not to give up, you know, don't just, think like you can't do stuff um speaking of which what um what kind of stuff are you working on these days um you know how are you kind of keeping yourself fresh and busy during, during i mean um lockdown? Like, i mean I, shoot, I mean there's been a lot to shoot because like that so going back to having this space in downtown um it was really crazy because now that i was you know spend like just all of my time down here pretty much all these demonstrations started happening that were literally like I could walk out the door of the building and like, okay, like I can go shoot this. So I've been allocated a lot of interesting opportunities. Just literally walk, I could hear what's going on, walk outside and go shoot. So I got a collection of, you know, demonstration images. Um, you know, I try to keep up with like printing here and just archiving them. So it's like, I've had that stuff, some documentation of uh, COVID 
kind of stuff going on, whether it was like everything closed down, people, masks, all that stuff. Um, so the lotuses that you guys were talking about earlier, that was like after shooting a lot of the demonstrations, it was like a wave of uh, just emotions you're around. And it, it, it affected me. Like it was just like heavy. So I just needed something a little bit kind of calming to neutralize that. And Echo Park Lake has these amazing, lo amazing lotuses patches that were blooming. So I was just walking there one day and decided to take a couple photos that I've never photographed flowers before. Kind of saw the results. I was like, okay, like this is, this is gonna be my next project for the next like three weeks. So every morning I would walk over there, usually with like a roll of film and just shoot till the film was done and keep doing a rinse and repeat. If I shot enough black and white, okay, I'm gonna go back with color film this time. Okay, I shot enough with a 90, I wanna go back with a different lens and just doing that. So I built up a little fun body of work of that for myself. Um, being able to do the M10R, you know, shooting with that was like fun to be able to have like a directive project with Leica to make a body, body of work of images from that and do that was fun. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's been a lot to photograph, a lot to compile and put together and reflect, look back on images. So um, I'm always kind of like bouncing around doing something. And now it's just like, just trying to like focus more so on one thing long enough to like really exhaust it, you know? That's yeah, pretty cool. Definitely. Yeah. You're walking Definitely. out the door and you take um, a camera with you. What's, what's your go-to? Uh, I mean, normally it'd be uh, the film MP with the 50 APO. Like that's just like with Tri-X, like that's like, if I were to walk out, that's probably what I would grab. Um, I recently just got the MA. So um, kind of having fun with like just pure mechanical, no light meter and just like, having fun like gauging like just with my own eyes you know wow do and you if you were going to walk out with a digital camera <laughs> and you could just walk out with one uh, yeah i mean i i, I don't like i years ago i think we all explore this idea of like having multiple like bodies of different types and um it's exhausting so i just really love like if i'm gonna do digital i'll take the m10 monochrome with the, the 50 APO on that one. And like, that'll be what I go out with. I mean, the only time I ever really how, bring... Yeah, how magical is that? Because I've, I've never owned one, um, but I have some friends that just talk about the, the magic of, of that lens. And I mean, it's, 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 just, it's been my favorite lens for the past like six years, I think. I, w I was in New York and um, I don't know if you guys remember the spot. I don't know if they're still around. I think they have a website, but uh, Photo Village. Yeah, there I was like right across from B and H. Now they meet you I, in Starbucks. I just bought my SL from those guys. Okay, yeah. I mean they had that storefront like right across from B and H. And I remember this was like twenty fourteen when that APL lens was like really hard to get. Like Leica was like behind on manufacturing. And I walked up in there and they I don't know where they get it. They have like a ton of like mint condition Leica gear. Like um, and so I saw the lens Damn. there and I, te and I texted someone that I know that works with Leica. I was like, yo, look what I found. And they were like, send me the serial number. I'm going to tell you if it's real or not. And I sent it to him. He goes, yeah, it's a real, it's a real one. So like once he sent it to me, I bought it from them. Um, yeah. And it's pretty much been like my, my favorite 50, like since then. Did you use the Sumo Lux before that? Yeah, I had a Sumo Lux and an Octolux. Um, and you just, but, yeah. once shooting the Apple, you were like, that, I don't need to shoot with this at any, I don't need to shoot with this. Yeah, I mean, I, I still have a Sumo Lux. I, I'll, I'll use that more in the film bodies because just having that extra stop is like really, yeah. really helpful at times. But I mean, I don't know. It's like, I, I love the idea that like looking back on all these like iconic and great photographs made through history. And it's like, they didn't need too much. Like, you know, they weren't shooting yeah. with like Noctilux lenses. They weren't shooting with, above 6400 iso at the most and it's like they made some great photographs so I, I just love that uh sense of nostalgia where it's like even in this 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 crazy technological age to make a great photograph you don't need much you just need to like you know understand your eye and how you're seeing things and i think that's how that's when adam and i connect with photographers the most is over that sort of appreciation or uh, romance of, of, uh, about the past with, with photography and mm -hmm. You know, um, it's not for me, it's not about compositing and I can appreciate an, an amazing composite. Um, but it's about kind of getting back to the basics. And I think that's why like a photographer sort of have this little community because it's something other people can't appreciate or just can't wrap their head around. Um, 
but it but it really hits home when you you know when you're talking about you have one body one lens and Mm -hmm. everyone has their favorite and obviously it depends on what you're shooting you know um but everyone has a go-to and i think yours is one that's uh making a lot of people jealous for sure (laughs) especially me because i know that there's there's a there's this apple that i saw that was for like 4700 uh, you're gonna oh, wow. buy that lens, then. You know, you need to do it right now. I'm trying to see if I have it on my desk, because like that's the one thing. If I ever like, you, you got an extra, post... you got an extra one. Uh yeah, sure. Let me let me get. The... Oh, oh, here I, it is. I've so... got a drawer full of them. What are you kidding me? They're like mint <laughs> no, in my studio. But like, this is what's great is that whenever I, if I ever post a photo of it on social, people always are like in shock because like you can see oh, how much that's, I that's, use. That's... Oh, that man. Lens, you know? That's yeah. proper, man. You got that, the yellow filter going. And then yeah, M- so like, that MP is gorgeous. Let me see that. Yeah, I, bu- I bought this brand new like off Amazon like five like, years ago. Grass like, the, the shit subtle- out of it. Yeah, it's, it's getting there. You know, yeah. that that's the fun part about that is like seeing like a camera kind of grow with you and age with you, but you're not yeah, sitting there with sandpaper, just going <laughs> Lenny Kravitz. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh <laughs> um no so i mean that's like the, the the most intriguing thing if i ever post that lens like people are like wow you actually use it like you know props no, on actually using your lens yeah, you like, spend well, that yeah, money on the camera. lens i'm gonna fucking use it <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's been so many places with me and it's like as long as like the focus is on then like, like i'm not like i don't need to send it in for anything and it's like i'll just keep writing it till it how goes, often but, how yeah. often you got us how often do you send your stuff in uh, just when I feel it's like it's off a bit, um, I would send it to Jersey to like out there, but there's a couple of repair places out here in LA that mm-hmm. in the past couple of months have reopened. So like, I just been going locally. It's a little, little bit easier. The Jersey place is super local for Dan and I, it's, yeah, it's like, like 20 minutes from my 25 house. minutes. From I'll, me, yeah. I'll show up with my bat with a bag and I'm just like, Hey, uh, you yeah. Got, you got uh, is it, time? is it the actual, yeah. I, at the actual yeah. like office? The actual okay. headquarters. Yeah. So you go in, there's like couches, okay. a little waiting area. And sometimes if it's okay. on, on a digital camera, he, you know, the guy can, the team can just do an adjustment. And, you know, I had my M10 and my 50 Lux uh, paired up to each other. So I knew yeah. that like at one four, even if I was focusing at like m- the minimum cl- uh, focal distance, it was just, it was on. Cause sometimes right. you're like, well, you know, th- they always talk about, well, it's intolerance. And I'll be like, I know it's intolerance, but <laughs> I, you know, this is how I like to shoot. Yeah, it's so. fussy. You know how it works. Yeah. No, but the, the like, the like, uh, you know, headquarters is pretty nice. Um, it's pretty understated. The people there are incredibly nice and helpful. Super nice. You know, you can call them up yeah. and just be like, hey, you know, I, I'd like to come in, but I, I, I'd prefer if I can just kind of wait. And they'll be like, oh, you know, if you can get here tomorrow, like at 830, no problem. And like, they're, they're, they're just, they're awesome. Like, it's just such an, and it's so nice that they're, they're, they're so local for us. Mm-hmm. But yeah. um, I think the nice thing too about the Leica gear is that it's built really well. And um yeah. Obviously, you don't have a focus motor that's going to go bad. So, <laughs> well, well, I think, and, that, and that's like a realization too with like products. Um, the idea of like like heritage items, like so much stuff, whether it's clothing or even some like you know electronics, are just so disposable that like like it, it's nice to have something furniture cameras that you buy. It's like you know it's going to last. Like you know, even like the M9, it's like that camera is like ten years old, just about you know, and it's like. Yeah, still doing what it does in, in, in a great old. way. Eleven, right? Yeah, yeah. it's like I'm hoping on, that it. I'm hoping that it on September 9th at nine o'clock at nine o nine. It'll be eleven years from the announcement. Wow, and yeah. I thinks about that every day. No, on nine nine o nine. Should I have so much shit going through my head right now? It's unbelievable. Uh oh. <laughs> now now. Now my I'll sell my else my M6, I'll with something else I'll get because an M I almost had an MP almost yeah a guy w- would have taken my Q2 yeah um and then it, it, the deal fell through but he had just like this beautiful MP because uh, yeah I it's 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 it's, it's a great I got because I had, like I said I had the M6 and with like the MP I just love like the film advanced lever the rewind knob well, like, I I put I was, put a, a, a M3 advanced lever on my M6 because I like nice. that or an MP I put I like liked it more than the plastic tipped one yeah yeah but the material's different it's not brass it's not right the M6 is in brass it, yeah I think the uh, yeah I, I forgot what they said they like, not. 
magnesium. It's a, yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not brass. I don't, you know? I don't know. It's it's not brass, so it's not. It's never going to patina like that. And it's a camera, like you said. You hold on. You hold on forever. You have a. You mm-hmm. know, if you treat it right, that's how I feel about uh, the M3. And it's hard to feel that way about digital cameras because as much as you get it connected to them, they have their expiration date. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously that's why you'll see like the past five years, like just prices of analog cameras skyrocketing, like stocks, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy, but it's just like, it goes to a heritage item because not many people are making things like that anymore. And, you know, so you gotta, you gotta appreciate them while you have them. One of the best things about the Leica M system is the fact that you can take a, you know, a modern lens or a 50 year old lens and use it Mm -hmm. on whatever, you know, M body, whether it's film or digital. And get different results, of course, but you, they're, they're universal. And I think that that's mm-hmm. one of the great things about the company is that they've been able to maintain that throughout their, their history to keep their legacy going. So that if you do invest in their stuff, even with the adapter, like I love the adapted end lenses on the SL. I think that mm-hmm. that's amazing, you know, being able to, to shoot with that. And, I, and, and there are photographers that we've met and talked to that that's why they bought the SL. So mm-hmm. that they could adapt their M glass because they like the viewfinder and all that other stuff. So it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's like it's like a, it's an amazing ecosystem to throw all these different lenses on these different bodies if you feel like. But it's all designed to work well with one another and not you know um, not just in hopes that it does good, but they they have that in mind that you know when they when they make these cameras. Definitely. Yeah. That's really cool, man. Um, so uh, yeah, so I see you you got some prints for sale but not many you're, no you're um i i, I rarely do a di- yeah well i mean i had one like i don't know i just like i rarely do additions in a sense like um what's been intriguing for me with the social aspect is like i'll just make prints for myself um here and when people start seeing a print come out of a machine then they start messaging me like hey like i'd like to buy that print like is that for sale can i get one like so i think people because we're looking at screens all the time, forget that photos are meant to be printed. So once you demonstrate that you are printing, the, 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 uh, the asking comes out. So a fun, engaging thing that I've been doing for the past couple of years is like people will message me. Uh, I'll give them sizing and pricing options. And then, yeah, if you want to buy it, there's PayPal or Venmo. And I'll, I'll note it as an artist print and make it for you, you know, to the size that you're looking for. So that's kind of like more or less how I, Overall, we'll do prints. Once in a while, I'll do additions. Um, but then once, like, I don't know, the, the, it's, a, it's a weird line to walk with the, the availability of digital printing, the vastness that you could do with it, but then without watering down, like, whatever it is you're trying to, like, sell or what you're trying to do, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you see my printer behind me. What do you use? I have the ProGraph 1000 and a ProGraph 2000. Nice. So what's the width you could do with the, the, the 2000? Uh, 24 by 36. Okay, nice. So 24 is the width. Yeah, 24 is the width. And then, but I mean, like for me, that was like um, more more than, that's like max of what I need. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think I need to print 40 inch wide stuff, you know, yeah. here. So. Yeah, I mean, I had an Epson years ago and I, I fought with that thing every time I tried to make a print. And yeah, I, I was I was an I was an Epson guy too, um, and then I got to see I had two master printers telling me how great the new Canon stuff was, and Dude, I didn't is, believe them. Uh, it is so I, good. Yeah, compared to Epson, and I was just like, "Wow, okay, yeah, like I'm done." So I got rid of all my Epson printers and just you know got these these Canons. And I love making digital prints from film photos. I really mm-hmm. enjoy doing that because I I have a couple. Um, every time I do it, you just see the character of the film and mm-hmm. to kind of marry the two together, um, is, is really cool. Uh, you don't, no, it you is. don't really, it is. You, you just don't get the character. You don't get all the nuance, all the detail, all the little kind of, you know, kind of special magic mm-hmm. until you make a print. Yeah. yeah. Everyone's looking at it on their phone and they're trying and you can pinch in and it just, like you well, said, yeah, photos see. photos need to be printed. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to show you. So, like, even, like, one thing I try to demonstrate to people is, like, if you go out, especially younger photographers, I'm like, if you're going to go out in your bag, I was like, just buy one of these. It's, like, four by six. 
when you come across someone like what are you doing what do you shoot it's just like oh like i i make these pictures you know so it's like this is way more impactful than pulling out your phone and saying here's my instagram and swiping so when they look through it's like look like you know and that impression of like tac- nice. you know, like a tactile uh experience so those for four. someone that you i don't i don't know four by six i don't know but i just carry this around with me and i'm just like hey this is this is what i do i just you know I mean, that, that, that's, you know, I'd be worried about losing some of those, but, um, but no, it's been interesting. Cause like, I remember like when I started bringing this thing out with me, a guy was talking to me in Santa Monica and like, well, what kind of photography do you do? And I showed him this and like his flip through it and his word was said, Oh, you're a real photographer. Yeah. That's like how he took the fact that I carry this around and not just like, well, here's my Instagram. Like, it's funny. You know, I it's, actually, I printed, um, a little seven by seven book and that's what I've been carrying around. Because mm-hmm. um, it fits in virtually any bag, any camera bag that yeah. I'm, I'm taking with me. Granted, they're not actual prints and sleeves like yours, but you know, it's it's an actual book, and I can just you know show it to somebody, hand it to them, yeah. and that's been really really helpful. It's funny. It seems like an outdated um, thing because no one does it anymore. But the impact when you see a print, when you see something printed, it doesn't matter if it's a four by yeah. six, five by seven, or you know. Um, I think the people that will appreciate it will really appreciate it. And the people that don't go, don't but, but, but it's, are, a, it's, you know. it's such a, um, it, like the idea of pulling out your phone and like Instagram, like in the sense of an in-person or like going to a gallery, even if it was an iPad and you're swiping through an iPad, it's just such a dull experience compared to someone presenting you with prints. So that's the way I take it. It's just like, you can do it. People can like take it in, but it's not the same. It's just, it just isn't like, I don't think photography was meant to be as an art form was meant to be limited to just digital um, experience. I couldn't agree more. I mean, when I go to, to meetings, I'm always looking around the photo books because I just feel like, yeah, I'm going to have my computer there if I need to like present on it. But I'm the first thing I do is I just put them on the table and I just pass them around because I would mm-hmm. rather people have that experience. And that is always what people tend to want to see. They're much more mm-hmm. intrigued by the book and the actual physical print than like what they're seeing on the screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's just for us as people, it's like that's it's we take things in a lot and just in a different way when it's like a tangible item to hold, you know, reading reading words off a page of a book versus like, you know, the screen of a tablet. Like they can do they can reach the same end goal, but something resonates a little bit differently with one or the other, you know. Right. I think yeah, the, the thing is, is that it's so much more convenient to give somebody a digital copy. It takes so much more work and effort to put a book together or put prints together, mm-hmm. but I, it's worth it, you know? So I'm with you. Yeah. Brother. That's a good one. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I love that little, that little book that you have because it's so unpretentious, um, but um, it gets the job done. Yeah, you it know, does. It doesn't have no, your branding just... all slapped all over it. No, no. And I think too, cause like the biggest thing too, especially if you're like a street pho- photographer, you're going to go out and you want to make photos of people. Like, what are you doing? What is this for? You know, like nothing is going to get your, your point across far more than just like these, these are the kind of photos that I make and you know, someone will instantaneously get what you're doing. I've you been know, asking, like, yeah, I've been asking people more, uh, ever since, um, the, the protests have been going on in my town every day. There's, there's a group of people and I go there and I'll ask to take, you know, if I can take their portrait, if I, you know, if it's not like an active, um, they're holding signs or they're taking a break or there's someone else in the corner instead of just trying to some, you know, sneak it without them knowing, which you, you, you know, you mm-hmm. can do, but if you ask and you engage, you're like, can I take your picture? There's a guy, there was an old man the other day with just this nice sun coming in. He's sitting on the steps, smoking a cigarette, you know, and, and and he looked at me and goes, sure. You know, <laughs> and, um, I was like, thank you. I, I, you know, I appreciate it. I had my mask on, glasses, hat, my glasses, mm-hmm. my sunglasses. You can barely see who the fuck I am. And I'm just, you know, standing there and I had my film camera with me. And yeah. took a couple of frames and, you know. It doesn't hurt right. to ask. And especially if you're with an M body, whether it's film or digital, it's a hell of a lot less imposing. Then mm-hmm. if you're putting a giant DSLR and you know, <laughs> big fat lens and somebody, I mean, it's funny. Yeah. I, I, I did a, a magazine shoot this week um, and uh, the, the woman that I was shooting, um, you know, I had, I had a big lens on the SLR and she's like, it looks like an ostrich eye. 
because all <laughs> she could fixate on was like this giant lens, you know, like just like, you know, she was very, very timid. So I had to like, you know, put on my like photographer hat and kind of redirect and kind of get her to talk and open up. And then, you know, finally there was like little bits that I could kind of pull out of her and totally forgot about the lens at that point. But at first mm -hmm. she just was like paralyzed with this gigantic like eyeball sucking her soul. <laughs> and, and I get that. And with the M body, you know, it's, it's so like, it's so cute and friendly and, and it's interesting and it's retro. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a lot less intimidating. And I find that for that kind of stuff, more approachable, you can certainly get more out of people, strangers perhaps. Mm -hmm. For sure. Sweet. Yeah, we just we just hit that point in the conversation yeah, where it's I think like where everyone's like yeah, we could take it on forever. No, I mean yeah, it's up, it's up to you guys. I mean it's you know it's whatever um, whatever. I mean, if there's I, any other questions on what you guys are feeling, you know. I I mean I, this was incredible. As soon as I you know got turned on to your your work, um, I knew you'd be someone that uh, that we'd have a great chat with, and um, you know finally I was like. They gave it to, and it's in the M ten hours in the hands of someone who knows what they're going. Who, who's going to do something good with it? Um, and well, well, well I, pre I pre definitely appreciate that. It was, it was, you know, this one hell of a camera. That's all I can say. And you know, I think there's a lot of people who are going to still be like, "Do you really need it?" And the way they, the way they told me is like, "We're not trying to replace the M ten P. It's just a different option. If yeah. you want bigger, here it is. If you don't, then you know, there's still this." I mean, a buddy of mine who I follow is another like a shooter, like like all of us with SL and M bodies. He got the R, and he basically was like, you know, if you, um, he basically was like, look, if you want it, and you have the extra cash, you know, you're definitely going to get a little bit more out of it. The color is a little bit different. There's certainly more recovery of involved. But if you're fine with the M10P and it does everything you need, there's really not, you know, an you know. The jump is not so great, but anyway, whatever. Obviously, you've had it, yeah. and you know, <laughs> yeah. so I'm, I shouldn't even be talking because I'm talking no, about my but, ass because I don't even know. We're, 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 well, we're, we're just sharing information with any listeners, you know, and hopefully it, it helps them figure out what they, they might want to do with their, their photography and their cameras. And I think that I would love to try the M10R because I think that that's one of those cameras that I need to try um, because, because it's a huge jump you know, price wise mm -hmm. and megapixel wise, whatever. So it'd be nice to be able to get one in my hands and play with it and see ex exactly like, how does it feel? Do I really feel that there's a value in these files is whatever. I, um, I got my eyes set right on that Apple. So I can push, <laughs> I can push that off. The problem with this podcast mm -hmm. is that we always end up spending each other's money. So pretty. Well, as soon as Adam signs good. off, I'm, I'm, I, I got, <laughs> you're going to go hunting. No, I got a personal question for, for you. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh shit! Wow, I see how that works. Or you can see the you want to see the Yented work? Yeah. All right, whatever. Adam can always cut this part out. <laughs> what do you do? What do you do with that nine thousand? Do you use it? Oh, oh the nine thousand? About... Yeah, the scanner. Yeah, yeah. Like that's like um, a different look because um, so a buddy of mine. Let me see if I. Have, oh yeah. So a buddy of mine put me onto it i I'm, I'm a fear of like stuff getting backed up or having um in case of emergency so with with the imicons and the flex tight like i think in the last year or so like they didn't they didn't upgrade the software so like i had to get like my older mac pro to run it they won't mm -hmm. run on catalina okay um they're not making them anymore like they said they stopped they're gonna stop making they'll still service them mm -hmm. so while it's a great scanner it's technology and there's always a chance of something just fucking completely losing it uh so a buddy of mine in new york who's like yo like you should check out these like 9000s like in price comparison they're amazing quality scanners mm -hmm. so you know i did the research that you know ccd similar type of deal but he was like but the, the, the thing is you got to get these holders for it so are, are you using like the stock holders for it so i have the 5000 yeah so the 5000 has the automatic feed for six yeah. frames or just the yeah, manual. but but it's but it's like but it's like a tray you put into. No, no, no. Um, it's not okay. No, it's so. This is. Oh, okay. 
So they all look like this, whether or not you put, um, you can go frame by frame or you just put a, yeah. uh, a, a patch of six and then it just pops right in. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this one is like, was like a like tray. A, yeah. But yeah, so this is like, I think these are, these are like the stock trays that come with it. Yeah, yeah. So like you can do two, right? But obviously like the thing I've learned with scans, it's, it's all about how flat your negative can stay put while it gets scanned. So a friend of mine in New York put me onto this dude in like Germany somewhere that makes 3D prints film tray holders for the 9000 from scratch. So like he does like these cool ones, but Jesus. it's kind of ill because he adds magnets to it. Oh, man. And so that when I scan with this, I can get the frame line of the negative, like not the branding of the film, but like the actual edge you of the negative. You can get the frames of that? Yeah, the black, the black frame yeah. lines you can get with this, yeah. So, because the guy will ask you, like, how, how he tight etched, do you want? Because he etched it out. He, he, he built it from scratch. Because yeah, I'm so sitting he, here with a file trying to file down, um, you know, and it, it, it's, it's extremely difficult. And yeah, then, and then you can, um, so it also what he does, so you'll ask him, what film do you shoot with cameras? And what film do you shoot with? And he'll make the trays for it. So if you shoot, like, medium format. So I, I have an X-Pan that I'll shoot with sometimes. And he'll make, like, these coded. Mm-hmm things on there so if it expands so like when you load this onto it and you put it in the machine it recognizes the frame line of an x pan wow so yeah so it's really intriguing and you know so I, i'll use the flex type um for like just not of overall like the the, the exact images i want to scan i'll use that i like i said i have a pack on so that's kind of like really just to get an idea of like what i want to what scan. you're working with yeah yeah, and then this one is like just for like a specific thing. If I want the frame line, or if I want like a certain, or if I'm scanning a lot of stuff at once, like and I just need to get through it, you know, I'll use this one. Yeah, I mean that's kind of the problem I'm having now is I want to be able to get some frame lines in, mm -hmm. and um, I don't want to get like the film name. I don't need to go that wide. I just yeah. I want the natural um, border, and yeah. I want to be able to choose if I don't want it or if I want it. Um, yeah. And right now, like, I don't have that option. Um, and it's kind of frustrating because it's like, I'd, I'd rather consolidate. I have the V850, Epson V850 for my medium mm -hmm. format, basically. And then I have the Nikon 5000. So I would love to just sort of consolidate and have one scanner that can do both incredibly mm -hmm. well. And like you were saying, be able to, you know. It's like you just bought the 9000. Because <laughs> it makes the most sense with um with your with your film scans, so you just have the lab do processing. You're not having them even do a low res scan because you're just going to do the scanning no. regardless. Yeah, so that's then, pretty cool. And, and, yeah, and, and the thing that really intrigued me about the Flex Tide or the Imicons is that they they make a three F file, which is like a raw negative scan so like you always have this like raw file of your scan that you can go back and adjust and tweak it and then export like a 16-bit tiff so that really was a big thing for me it was like, ma like major future proofing of your scans down the road that like you could always go back so even with a tiff like you're going to be limited in some kind of latitude but like yeah, yeah I you have a 3f you know yeah i mean i've i've read that and so i've always been doing a, a raw scan from and it's probably just the more, you know, that kind of scanner has more information than, than what I'm working with. But I always kind of then just for black and whites, I'll invert, um, you know, either in, uh, I like Photoshop better than um, the other ones, Negative Lab Pro, which is a plugin for Lightroom that I can use the inversion for. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I find that there's way more latitude when you're kind of doing a raw scan. Mm -hmm. rather than assigning having the scanner do work and assigning yeah. a, a profile to it yeah yeah so if you ever upgrade um, to a 9000 let me know and i'll give you the guy's email send me like, up with that just, guy yeah <laughs> he just emailed him he's like okay yeah it's gonna take like a month because i'm gonna make it and like you know you get them and it's amazingly built stuff like it's not flimsy it's not cheap and yeah it's it's, it's you have that like, for 35 millimeters well I have, yeah, 35 slide film. Um, like he, he just sent like a bunch of holders and it's yeah. like, it's really cool. Sweet. So you're <laughs> <laughs> nice. No, I, I nerd out. Like I'm, I'm the yeah. kind of person if I go, 
get into something, I'm like, I go all in on it. And photography, I've been all in, you know, I've been shooting for almost 20 years and I've been like all in like since, since picking up a camera. So yeah, that, that's how I feel. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Well, one of these days, if you ever make it back to New York or we ever get out to LA. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I, either way, please. Um, I, it's been, it's been so bum Cause like the past few years, like my tradition of like summer is like take my daughter to New York and like, you know, hang out with family, see 4th of July and then, you know, come back. And like, this was like, you know, the first time in like these few years, like we didn't get to do it. And like, mm-hmm. you know, just even see my family out there. It's just like, so like, it's such a, downer for the year to like not be around people you love and enjoy and you know i love new york as a city like you know and it's just like to not like this is probably my first year in like 15 20 years maybe work i probably aren't can will not be able to make it out there which is like fuck but you know hopefully we could all get through everything in next year will be yeah, a, you know a new definitely. year I hope we push all this by, but I hope we push all this behind us yeah 100 yeah, percent. well awesome um it's been such an incredible pleasure having you on today. Thank you, guys. I feel like we made a new friend. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, we all love photography. You know, we all love awesome. Leica. And, you know, we, we share a similar outlook. So it's great. You know, I definitely would love to catch up with you guys in person uh, in the near future. Yeah. yeah. And, and we'll definitely we'll keep in touch online for sure. We'll hit you up on your Insta. Um, for anybody that um, wants to know, it's Stefan Vanasco. I'm going to put all of your links. Be, your, I'm going to put your link to your um, your Insta, your website, and um, people can find visual from there as well. Um, I suggest um, if you haven't already looked at um, Stefan's Instagram that you just go. Just go. Go right now. Go there right now. Um, really wonderful stuff. Beautiful work. And um, just just a pleasure and it's so nice being able to hear the process you know and your thought process and your mentality and um all those kind of good nuggets behind what makes these absolutely beautiful photos because it's interesting you know you you just look at somebody's instagram and you really don't know how that came to be so now we have Uh some some insight on both you and your work and i felt like i learned a lot and i think a lot of people that listen to this are going to get some really amazing nuggets out of it as well and i think daniel learned a lot too and he um he's actually probably looking at a nine thousand as we see he can't wait to get off he's like adam stop talking so i can get myself a nine thousand uh, in fact i might just edit in it down just to 50, that one little in fact one little fi- bit and a yeah, 50 and a 50 well, the, the, i think the 50 is first yeah yeah 50 is wrong with that i mean lens, the lens is like that's no, the magic it's all about that yeah well it, it really really was such a such a pleasure yeah yeah thank you guys i appreciate the opportunity again to be on here and talk about something that we all love with, with you guys so it was cool all right guys so look that's going to do it for us another episode of the brooklyn photoworks iso 320 podcast that's it for now and we'll see you soon mm-hmm.